to Thinking Class, Bridget. Thanks very much for joining me. Glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me. It's a pleasure. It's really good to meet you. We, we had a good exchange on, on LinkedIn. I was, I was drawn to you because of your articles in the European Conservative, because you write about the reality on the ground of, of sustainability policy, which I don't commonly find in other media outlets. Uh, and, and because of that, it, it seems so unfrequently reckoned with by business and, and the public at large. Uh, I'm sure we'll get into that. But first, what drew you to writing widely about the practical consequences of the, the European Union's sustainability program as an American in Spain? Sure. I, I think it's because it's a topic that interests me. Um, I started journalism in the Intermountain West of the United States, so in Idaho, right by Yellowstone National Park, in this little town where there was a lot of tension between like kind of the skier recreation set and the um, and the Mormon farming set. This was a, an area that had experienced a lot of demographic growth in the 90s and stuff like that. And they were going through a huge um, repurposing of land use, a huge new land use plan at the time that I was working there. And so, and, and I was reporting on agriculture. Agriculture was very important. I did a lot of potato articles. Um, yeah, but anyway, so that kind of took me into um, a lot of environmental issues, because obviously there's a lot of environmentalists out there. Agriculture always touches on environmental issues and land use planning, and then being in this area where we were literally surrounded by public lands, by national parks and national forests. So that was kind of my introduction. Now I'm in Spain, and basically I live in rural Spain. I live um, in Astorga, which is a, a small town of about 10,000 people way up in the northwest corner of Spain. We're a lot closer to Portugal than we are to France. And we're right on the Camino de Santiago. I walked through it in April. Astorga is beautiful. I was, ah, you, I, walked, I, you I, literally I, walked right by my house, I can guarantee you. Yes. If you didn't wake me up with your, if you, you know, if you were talking while you're pumping in the morning. So um, anyway, yeah, we live literally like a block from the municipal albergue de, per, de peregrinos here. Oh, wow. Yeah, 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 okay. yeah, yeah. So, um, so anyway, yeah. So there's that, and then my husband is also a sci is a scientist. So he's involved in he's a plant geneticist. So I kind of you know I'm always getting like little things like this in my ear. Um, and then, like I said, we're just living here. So I'm like far from the halls of power here, where the closest people that I have who are who are in touch with this and who are living it are the people on the ground. You know, we have friends that are fighting, having uh, a huge solar park being put right in their backyard. This area is getting a lot of solar parks being wanting to be planned and wind parks. And so there's a huge movement against that. There are some people for it as well. So I, I kind of live it in some ways. I kind of live it on a day to day basis myself being in a rural area. So and then. And then as I would start, as you know, it just so happens that then the EU decides or Ursula von der Leyen decides, let's do a European Green Deal. So now it's like the biggest policy, one of the biggest policy issues coming out of Brussels. So I had kind of this personal thing. And then right now, it's just a really hot topic as well. Yeah, it is. It's interesting um, how, how often you hear people complain that there isn't enough uh, policy um, uh, or, or there isn't enough um, oiling of the wheels for the policy to get through into real life um, uh, change, for example. People say, oh, there's lots of good talk about sustainability, but I don't think that's true at all. As far as I can see, the EU have done quite a lot of relaxing of planning applications to be able to to get these things to, to pass through when previously they otherwise wouldn't have done because of well environmental impacts in some cases or impacts on on the people so i think there is a, a little bit of a, a myth and i don't really know why that's there that there isn't enough support for this stuff because it is i mean it's moving at a at a, a rapid pace and it seems not to be um necessarily that popular with uh, the people that it's affecting uh, down on the ground yeah, no, I cannot tell you exactly what goes through Ursula von der Leyen's head or any of the commissioner's head. 
or all or any really of the, you know, backroom talks they have or anything like that. What I can tell you is that it seems that uh, for various reasons, there's a huge push for an energy transition. And the idea of renewable energy has become the conventional environmental wisdom, right? We need to, uh, climate change is being caused by carbon emissions. And so we need to get carbon emissions down, which means that we need to go to renewable energy. Um, and so that's where this push for wind and solar power, electric cars kind of comes from. Um, you know, Obviously, I think the war in Ukraine and kind of in the energy crisis that came from that, from being cut off from Russian gas, helped push it through more. But I mean, basically, from what I from what I can tell, the idea of renewable energies is conventional environmental wisdom. And so I personally kind of think, too, that, you know, the Green Deal, it's been pulled out, Ursula von der Leyen pulled it out as like her flagship project for her EU presidency. I mean, it seems like, it, honestly, it seems to me like it could be a lot of, instead of like intense thought of like, what are really the environmental problems in Europe and how can we address them? It's very like flashy and showy. We're going to reduce emissions by this. We're going to do this. And so you see that a lot of it seems to be these kind of broad brush policies that are full of the conventional wisdom about carbon emissions and decreasing carbon emissions and nature restoration, which I'm not saying that there's not truth to it, you know, that there's not things that need to be improved. Um, you know, forest, forest could be much improved. Many areas could be much improved environmentally, even though Europe is quite nice environmentally already in many areas. Um, you know, there is a lot of controversy around the science of climate change and carbon emissions and things like that. But I feel like overall, more than, more, more than um, you know, these are the genuine problems that Europe faces that we've seen is that it, it's a very politically showy policy. And then, and then the rubber meets the road. Well, and then, you know, with this push for renewable energies, how do you get it through? You just, if, if, we're, if we really need this transition, if we really want it, if we're really going to sink all of this money into it, we're going to have to get these solar panels up as quickly as possible. And so you're going to have to reduce regulations around it. That's the only way, that's the only way to do it. Yeah, well... You've written extensively about some of the negative practical consequences, and there are definitely plenty that I've managed to grab a hold of in some of my research as well. But before we get there, let's see if we can um, spot the successes. Is there anything um, within the regulatory program that you think has been a success on the ground? <laughs> um Nothing comes to mind, I'm afraid. <laughs> Apart from, I suppose, if they say they, they want to build lots of solar, that they're managing to build lots of solar. So it's a success in so far as the objectives that they're setting out to achieve, they're achieving those objectives. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. In the Green Deal, yes, yes. I mean, I do think in general that we have to acknowledge that the environmental movement is extremely necessary and extremely and has brought successes like overall you know if we look at past decades i mean if we if we didn't have we can point to lots of failures of government oversight lots of problems that exist but if we didn't have environmental regulations in place let's face it corporations would do whatever they want and they wouldn't really care how much they polluted in a lot of ways i mean we, we have these regulations in place for a reason. We have cleaned up a lot. We have, I mean, we have the standard of living and we have Europe the way we have it in part because of an environmental movement that, and pushback from the worst parts of industrial exploitation. If we didn't have that, you know, now we're kind of in, in the next phase, which is a little bit different. And honestly, I can't really think of anything that I can say, um, oh, that that program was successful and that and that did a lot of environmental good in 
in a certain in a certain way. I mean, there could be. I mean, I could be wrong. Like, there's this um, the Raid Natura 2000, the Nature. Sorry, I'm saying it in Spanish, but it's the Nature Network 2000 to create these connections of protected areas. I mean, I think I think that's good to be to be conscious of that. Um, but yeah, how much? But also from from what I've been told, it's not as rigorous of a process as uh, as you would think it would be. And that even even here, um, according to groups that are pushing back against against solar panels and things like that, a lot of things uh, end up like like wind parks being close to these areas adjacent to them or even inside of them. Things that aren't supposed to be going on in these areas happen. I mean, in the Netherlands, they've had they haven't been able to keep the nitrogen levels down, apparently. And so these these areas are being you know, endangered and, and threatened because of, because of that. So. When you're talking about the areas being endangered and threatened, is that um, threatened with closure for being used as agricultural land? Is that what you're referring to? Well, okay. There's that threat. No, but there, um, the quality of the, of what's there, the, the environment can be, yes, can be, because apparently what happens when you have night, if your soil becomes too, too, has too much nitrogen or too much of certain nutrients, well, every species needs like a certain kind of soil that it grows best in. And so if it becomes too acidic, then the species that can't handle that will die off. And the species that love that nitrogen are going to proliferate. And obviously over time, that's going to change your biodiversity and maybe cut back on it. So... Yeah, yeah, that's a really tricky one, isn't it? The the, the nitrogen levels conversation in in the Netherlands. I mean, it was the the spark for uh, the the protests with the, the Dutch farmers' parties a, a few years ago, which then turned well turned into a, a political party, which was uh, up until a few months ago was polling in first place and then dropped off. People thought um, it was probably mixing its messages a bit, and uh, whilst Heert Wilders has just come in as uh, uh, as the the highest polled or highest voted for politician in the Netherlands, and people are focusing quite heavily on his stance on immigration. There are others referring to him as a as a climate denier, um, but there are others who have a probably a more careful reading of it and say, from an environmental perspective, it's because he's he's sucked up those votes from the the Dutch Farmers Party uh, that, that they would have otherwise got, and so. I wonder if there's a distinction to make here because it, in some respects it feels like the farmers in the Netherlands had been um, attempting to comply for many years with requirements from Brussels and then this time felt it like it was the straw that broke the camel's back that they couldn't possibly comply and then there was the threat of having farms taken away from them and not being able to farm again and so you know, generations upon generations of farmers at risk of losing their livelihoods. And, you know, you obviously got that pushback. But it's that fine trade-off, isn't it, that you've just raised as well, which is there's a biodiversity element to it too. And if the soil could no longer produce over time, then that becomes a big problem. Uh, I don't really know how to walk that line other than it seems like there are points to both sides and I, I don't know I don't know where you I don't know where you you, you kind of land to make sure you aren't removing people's livelihoods from them whilst also looking after the ecological um impacts yeah yeah I think in a, with, with a lot of things like we've kind of reached a point where I, you have to get, I think you have to look a little bit further. I mean, Dutch agriculture is amazing in the sense of they, it's extremely intense. I mean, this is one of the tiniest countries in the world. And I believe it's the second largest agricultural exporter in the world. So you can just imagine how intense that is. And, um, you know, and I have no doubt that Dutch farmers do their very best to make their farming as efficient and, you know, environmentally friendly as they can. I have no doubt about that. I mean, I think you just have to acknowledge that there's certain limits, you know, that there's this, and there are strains of thought in this, 
you know, maybe, maybe agriculture can only get so intense before there's just nothing else you can do. There's just no technological workaround that is going to mitigate the nitrogen and the phosphorus. And it's not just farming. This is where um, I understand that the party also got a lot of support because the other other sectors have faced um, regulations in regard to this, like the speed limit is limited in the Netherlands. It's very difficult to do, new, to do new, new building projects at a time when the Netherlands is desperate for new housing. So like a lot of sectors of their economy, they needed to expand the airport, I think. And that project had to be put on hold until they could they could, um, you know, mitigate some in some more other areas to give enough carb to give enough nitrogen credits or whatever to the airport. I might not be explaining it quite accurately, but I mean, they've had to slow down in almost every single area. This is an extremely intense co economy. It's an extremely densely populated country, and maybe there's just limits. Uh, well, that's something that we don't like to consider i suppose we, we've, we've no, we don't <laughs> we've uh, we've come to believe that there, there, there are no limits uh, in all manner of our in our, of our lives and uh, um i think that that is always um, the the rejoinder the people who um talk about limits is well try and get elected on a platform talking about limits to anything but you're right you, you do bump, you do bump up against them and um, I suppose there is. I mean, a, go on. no, and and maybe maybe do you sacrifice your nature areas? Do you just let at what? How much nitrogen can you really stand? We put this limit for these reasons that we put it, and maybe you know you could let it go higher, and that'll change your environment, and maybe that'll be okay too. I don't know. Maybe if there's only like, you know, five kinds of grasses that take over everything in the Netherlands, I'm totally making this up. I'm totally making this up. But, you know, <laughs> I don't know what all the, what the, the consequences would be. But, you know, that's another possibility. So, but then you'd have to convince, you know, I suppose people who like the species that will die off if there's too much nitrogen that they can live without those too. Yeah. There's also... The point that the Netherlands, as a the second largest exporter in the world of agricultural products, clearly is a pretty key part of global supply chains, which is what the EU generally quite likes, right? That most of its regulatory program is about uh, promoting a, a global supply chain in some way. And that's why it seems a little counterproductive uh, to to pinch the, the Dutch farmers that way, um, but then from a Dutch perspective, um, per perhaps there's a case to say, well, it, if you if you're going to be unable to contribute to the global supply chain, is, is there a way in which you can start to farm that is more conducive to ecological health and which might seek to provide for the immediate region in which that you you um are currently situated uh, got an example of there's a, there's a farmer he's quite prominent here in the uk at least um in the literary world so he used to have a typical corporate job he's from generations of farmers in the lake district and basically he was very bored with his life in london and decided he was going to go and take over the family farm and really hard work, obviously. And he decided that he didn't want to go down the route uh, or continue the route of all of the highly mechanized agriculture because he saw the impact that it was having on the land. And he remembered having grown up with a lot more plant life and um, bird life and animal life around him um, and decided that whilst he'd make less money, that he didn't think it was a sustainable way both for him and for the, the local area if he just relied on mechanized agriculture. So he switched it back to this mixed agriculture style um, setup that would have been used before the, the, the advent of all of those mechanized um, means of agriculture. And 
all of those things that he grew up with have started to come flooding back. So he makes he makes less money. It 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 um it costs a lot. Um, I'm sorry, it, it earns him a lot less money. But he made that choice because he decided that he needed to live within the limits, and clearly that would never get a platform anywhere. And um and and it's going to be a very individual choice. But I suppose it it illustrates that those who work very closely to the land, I think they can spot their limits. They, they know the land better than anyone making a policy. And I think that's the problem with technocracy is, you know, we sit in distant centers. We generally urban, we live in industrial um, cities or post-industrial environments. We've got no idea about the contours and rhythms of everyday life or the, the, the place that are going to be impacted by our policies. And we think in abstractions and logic and just think, oh, that, that plan will work. And then it goes and, uh, and, and, and hits reality. Reality always bites back in some way. And uh, I, suppose, um, I suppose from the Dutch soil health perspective and also from um, their, their contribution to the global supply chain, we're we're seeing the reality biting back uh, of both technocracy and I don't know life perhaps. Yeah, well, and I, to your point, I think part of the problem is that when you live in a technocracy, they um, they get to decide who who is going to have to live within the limits and who is not. So we know there's limits. Um, Ursula von der Leyen would even acknowledge that, right? And so we're trying to get back within our limits. So we're going to cut down, we're going to make the farmers go, the Dutch farmers go back within their limits. But are we going to make the car industry go back within their limits? Are we going, who else are we going to, because it all has limits. And so we should all be living in limits, whether we live in cities, whether we live in country, these limits are, the world is finite. As one, as uh, as a physicist that I interviewed said, you cannot have perpetual growth in a finite world. Now, this is this is a controversial statement, but it seems that we let's compare it to um, LGBTQ issues, the issues of being transgender. I mean, some the pushback there is that you cannot integrally change the sex of a body. This there is a reality, there is a, a physical limit to this. You're either born with the uterus or you're not. I mean, or this is whole this whole integral thing. But if that applies to the human person, does it not apply to the rest of reality, to the rest of creation? So, you know, this this is where it gets philosophical. It, it all it makes me think often of the um, what did G.K. Chesterton say? The practical man always arrives too late. <laughs> Yeah, Chesterton is a very sound bite ball author, that's for sure. Uh, uh, yeah, the talk about limits gets me thinking a little bit about um, Patrick Deneen's work, Why Liberalism Failed, and um, I know many others are, are articulating uh, the problems with liberalism well at the moment, which is it the emancipatory power of it uh, so is the seeds of its own destruction because in the end there's there are no other barriers or limits to overcome because they've thrown everything else away all restraint all limits whether they be cultural traditional um the various social norms and because it, when it's tied to economic liberalism it will just keep pushing and pushing and pushing until one day it starts to bump up against limits <laughs> and um and then there's nowhere else to go at that point because it's it's uh it succeeded but it succeeded almost too well and uh i suppose it's the question of what comes after that uh, after you've lived uh in every way that there aren't any limits and uh clearly there were lots of things that kept us in check culturally and traditionally and what have you uh before before they they fell to the wayside Mm -hmm. I make two observations. Um, so one is that I feel a lot of sympathy for farmers. I mean, let's face it, they we have this model of agriculture that is about mass production. So 
I mean, it's not, it's not easy to be a farmer. You had, you're subjected to all kinds of vicissitudes from market vicissitudes to whatever can happen to the weather. Most farmers in the United States, I honestly can't say so much for Europe, but it could be, they operate on debt. Most farms in the United States operate on a debt. You know, you buy, you have to buy all these inputs every year and hope that, you know, you get them back at the, at the end of the season and, and things like that. So we've, um, made, you know, we've made this model of agriculture that is very, it's almost oppressive to the farmer. And I think one thing that shows in that is that farming has one of, I think it has the highest professional suicide rate of any profession. And one of the tragedies of this whole Dutch situation has been the farmers that have committed suicide. But I think we also have to acknowledge that, um, Farmers have a very high suicide rate as it is. And it's something very telling about our society, I think, because when you think about it, agrarian societies of old, you know, the Euro agrarian Europe had very, very, very low suicide rates. I mean, suicide was like very rare. And now, you know, people lived in the, in more, I mean, there's lots of reasons, but it's something that should really make us reflect on the model of society that we have and the way that we, that we are made, that really that we have made farmers do their farming through like the green revolution of the post-war era and the hyper-industrialization of farming and things like that. I mean, we should really reflect on that, I think, as a society, not, you know, so we, should, so it, it should make us reflect. It really should. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, the farmers do seem to get hit from almost every angle in almost every nation as well. I mean, our Irish uh, cousins across the the Celtic Sea here from um, from from Britain, the, there was the, uh, the the methane emissions targets, which have led to that two hundred thousand coal of cows that have been mandated over the next few years, which is I think something like a third of Ireland's cows. And again, it goes back to this global supply chains point, which is you're trying to reduce methane emissions in this country of five and a half million people. You're going to remove protein from the local supply chain. They're going to then have to rely on a global supply chain, which probably means if they want to keep eating beef, which there's every chance they will do, because culturally that hasn't changed and isn't going to change overnight because of a methane emissions mandate. And that means where they're going to get it from or elsewhere, which is going to require all the emissions to bring it over. Or if they are going to eat the um, the processed food on the global supply chain, you know, that's going to require soy. And that soy is going to come from the Amazon rainforest, which has been chopped down for it. And so all, we're robbing from Peter to pay Paul here, uh, as some would argue, that you're going to kill 200,000 cows for a start. Your methane emissions ledger book's going to look pretty pretty healthy. Well, that doesn't mean they disappear. They just get outsourced somewhere else and in some other way. And what do you have at the end of it? But 200,000 dead cows and lots of angry and probably less rich and probably more heavily indebted uh, dairy and meat um, cow farmers. So it is a, it is a, a, a crying shame, really. Uh, I, I don't really know. Uh, I don't really know where it all goes. And I, I think there is a, um, there is something else to, to take into account here, which is we can place targets on things like methane, but then we don't take into account the interactions within creation, which is the, the grasses on which the cows stand does a very good job of processing methane. It sucks it in and turns it into something else. But I very much doubt that's being taken into account with regards to the policy making. It's not to say it take it does it all, but the reason why Ireland is that kind of green and pleasant land. Oh, hang on, the mix of my metaphors. That's England. Ireland is the Emerald Isle. The reason why it's the Emerald Isle is because of that um, relationship with uh, the weather, with the the people and the the animals on the ground, and just by wiping out a whole bunch of cows, you you. That there are a bunch of knock-on effects, some unintended consequences that you're going to have, not least the food situation. Yeah, I have a feeling that Ireland will not be less green after culling 2,000 cows. I have to admit, um, 
<laughs> but to but to your point, this is the thing about farming that uh, makes these huge broad stroke policies like not very effective. Um, it's very it's very particular to the very to the to the actual practices of the farmer on his land, of his particular piece of land. There's lots of little fixes that farmers can do that make a huge difference. Um, so, you know, at a granular, it's really important to look at it at a granular level. And we've kind of have this, again, with a lot of in our society, we have this mass, mass, like one size fits all kind of production. Like, for instance, even back in the day when Europe was expanding and more countries were coming into the common agricultural policy. I mean, you can read um, how in Portugal, they were Portugal, Iberian Peninsula, arid climate, land of olives. They're cut, having to cut down olive trees to plant corn. That's the stupidest thing ever. And here in this area where I live, they really should not be growing corn for markets. But like, but this is how, this is the system we've created. So where these kinds of things happen. And apparent, I've read that there's, um, and all of it is like we grow, like the number of species that we grow is like pretty limited as well. So for instance, I have read that there is um, a, a, a type of corn that's red that grows, that would actually be great to grow on the Iberian Peninsula. I think there, there's some people, niche people that are growing it up in the Basque country and things like that. But these are the kinds of like innovations on a very particular level that could really help the environment and farmers a lot. But we're just not, you know, it's, ma it's mass production for mass industries. We're going to, you know, everybody needs, all the farmers need to produce tons and tons of beets that they get like cents on the, on the kilo for. And so they have to produce lots and lots and lots of beets to have a, to have a decent salary at the end of the year versus, so, and all of this goes to, you know, big factories where the sugar is produced, where they want to sell lots and lots and lots of cheap sugar, et cetera, et cetera. And so that's, that's the model that we have. Um, and the, okay, here's another example. So it was last year when there was all this drought in the, in Spain and the war, or maybe it was 2022. Anyway, I did write about this, but Farmers were, were asking like, okay, can we plant a lot more sunflower seeds and have that count for our protein? Because what happens in um, European farming is that we have to import a lot of soybeans or, or animal feed that's all soy-based because we don't have, um, soy doesn't grow well in Europe. We can't really compete with soy that's grown in the Americas, whether North or South America. They can just grow it a lot better and a lot cheaper. And soy is a lot of the base for like animal feed, which Europe does have a lot of animals. There's lots and lots of cows and pigs in Spain that all need to be fed. So you have all this feed that's based on things that have to be imported. So part of what the, um, what the agrarian policy is trying to do is to get farmers to produce things that have more protein so we, can, so we don't have to outsource that. Well, sunflowers have sun protein. But um, in and of itself, it doesn't have enough protein to qualify as like a high protein crop. But apparently when you process it, so they're mostly used for oil because they have a lot of oil. So, but when you process it and you take, and then you concentrate the, um, the, the meal, like the sunflower meal that's left over from the oil, when you concentrate it, it's pretty, it's a good enough concentrate of protein that's actually used in animal feed. And so... Spanish farmers were saying, well, can we get the protein subsidy for the sunflower cakes? And they were told no. And sunflowers, it, and that's super unfortunate because sunflowers is a really great crop to be growing in Spain because it can grow well. I mean, we have tons of sun and it can grow, it can grow pretty good without, um, without irrigation. It doesn't, it's not as, in, as corn needs a lot of water to grow well. But sunflowers really don't need that much. So we should really be doing more sunflowers than corn, for example. 
but the Euro in that case, the, the European Union said, no, sorry, we're not going to make this exception, even in this situation where we can't get all the sunflowers that we usually would from Ukraine and, and let Spanish farmers get this, this subsidy to help them produce sunflowers. So I'm sorry, that was a little rambling. I'm not no, sure not where... at all. Not at all. Uh, it, there is all good stuff in there. Uh, it's me who is the rambler. So uh, please keep on grabbing that mic off me. And no, and but one more point, um, and to this point of like putting limits on and like what is the, what what is to be gained from you know culling cows and things like this. I mean, I think from an economic perspective too, if you're going to target an area for um, shrinkage in order to meet your environmental goals, farming is a great target because while there are a lot of farmers and while it has a certain amount of weight in the, um, in the European e economy, Europe is a next net exporter of food. You know, we are not going to starve because there are a few less cows, even if, you know, because there are less cows, we can, we can cut back on our production and Europe will not starve. We are a net net producer of food. So there's that, there's that to begin with. And then you also have, as you've noticed, noted, if it doesn't come from Europe, it'll come from somewhere else. And that's where, like with the Mercosur Agreement, you have these other countries from Australia to Latin to South America that are just chomping at the bit to get deeper into the European market. And so what, it, what has the European Union, but ec and economically, that's to your advantage as well, because like I said, and, the, and actually the economist for the European conservative, one of the economics writers has talked about that, has written about this. When you think about like value added and things that are really profitable and that bring a lot of weight into your economy, it's not agriculture, it's industry. This is why the European Union, this is why Germany is so, Germany is a great agricultural producer as well. I mean, they have wonderful places to produce act, to produce wheat, to produce many things, things like that. But they're desperate to not lose their industry, right? And so what, what, is, to, what is to the European Union's economic advantage? And this is what the farmers have complained about. We keep being the trade dif differential you're going to let all of those cheap Latin American products, South American products into Europe so you can sell cars to Latin America, to South America, because you're gonna get a lot more economic bang for your buck from selling cars than you are from selling wheat. And so if you're going to cut something out, it may as well be agriculture. If you're gonna cut down, you'd rather cut down on agriculture than you would on cars. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, I suppose that is the story of the Industrial Revolution as well, which I suppose we keep on having this one badged up as the fourth Industrial Revolution, the, 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 green, uh, the green energy transition is... Well, this, this is know, the result... The money is. Yeah, well, partly. Um, I think this is more a result of globalization because agriculture was industrialized to make it profitable at a market level. You know, we went from subsistence, local trading, agriculture to, and this is the other ironic thing, the interesting and ironic thing about um, the Green Deal and a lot of the farming policies, like the nature restoration things. It will, you kind of not noted this, but it essentially will take us back to kind of that pre, in a way, it wants to take us back to that pre-industrial farming instead of having intense monoculture agriculture where we have smaller smaller hold farms with a variety of things and they had and they had the hedgerows where the birds were and you know and all of these things because the farmer wasn't he was first he wanted to produce first and foremost an abundance for himself and his local community and have a little le and have enough left over to do some trade for the other things that he needed, but he was not producing for the markets. But industrial agriculture produces for the markets. Farmers don't, I mean, yes, they produce our food, they feed us, they do, but they don't, at, 
but they don't at the end of the day go around saying, did everyone in Europe have a full stomach tonight when they went to bed? No, when they do their calculations, they have to look at the bottom line, just like car makers do, just like everybody else does. They look at the bottom line. And am I in the red or am I in the black? Yeah, well, that that point, which I know I alluded to earlier on, talking about James Raybanks and his book, uh, there's a whole uh, section within that book where he talks about how he remembers growing up on the farm and it being mixed agriculture and then the advent of agricultural finance hit and all these huge mechanical um uh, means in which the farm came on, you know, these these massive tractors and huge combines and people would be sold the productivity uh, carrot and that was when the debt started and then they realised once the debt started they need to farm more and more and more and in the end it became a, uh, a more, um, what's the right way, intrusive way of farming than otherwise would have done before um, that you're able to spray pesticides on indiscriminately and um, there was much less care taken for the land, but it was because the farmers had ended up under huge pressure to be able to produce enough to be able to pay off th this this machinery. So uh, now we're in this position where, and I, I think Ray Banks talks about in his book, which is the farmers will keep on getting pinched and yet they're being pinched by the same policymakers that ultimately helped shepherd them, uh, no pun intended, but it works very well, helped shepherd them into this, uh, this, this way of, of business. And now they're, they're, they're having it taken away from them, but it doesn't stop the fact they've still got bills to pay. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yes, no, Wendell Berry from the American side, Wendell Berry talks about this, how Farmers went from being um, self-sufficient and sustainable. They, you didn't have to buy seed every year. You could, you know, you don't have to buy seed unless, you know, unless you, un unless you're buying it from Monsanto, right? Uh, and except in the modern conditions, you don't necessarily have to buy seed. You can take the seed from your tomatoes. You can take the corn, you can take the, the corn and the wheat, and you can save some to, you know, replant for the next year. You don't have to buy it unless you're unless you have some kind of a um, like a patented product, I believe, something like that. Um, and the inputs. So, yeah. Oh, but yes, basically, basically, that's what happened. They he talks about the same thing that and they went from this model where with machinery, with their with all their products, they were self-sufficient. But now, again, we're at, yeah, we're at the debt model. Sorry, there's another thought I had about that, but it'll come back to me. No worries. Well, I'm about to jump around a bit, almost back to the beginning of our conversation, because we talk quite a lot about solar panels. And I think to the listener and the viewer, solar is considered to be a very good thing. And what could be wrong with solar? Uh, you, you've written a little bit about the environmental impacts that's had locally. Uh, would you mind unpacking that a bit, please? Yeah. So, um, so basically the problem with solar panels, especially on a mass level, is that you basically take um, a, an ecosystem, a landscape, and you cover it with solar panels. I mean, we're not talking about like a few solar panels. We're talking about, so for instance, our friends, they live out, in, they live in a village outside of town. You get their backyard goes out to these um, extensive hills that, and fields and a little bit of forest. There's like one shepherd who still the who still uh, has a, 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 a herd of sheep that he brings around occasionally. Well, the solar park they want to build would basically you go to the top of like that first hill and it would basically cover everything you could see that I can see for a while. So like my friend who who who's there, she has a horse, um, horses and things that she like takes for long walks out there. All that would be over, over for them. And then, uh, and solar, and then the solar panels themselves they leach uh, lots of metals into the environment. So you have to um, environment. It, it's going from from the environmental impact that they had seen that it would cause. It would 
mess with the water systems, the whole water systems of this area. And they already have problems with like their groundwater and their drinking water. Um, in these solar parks, they have to they end up using a lot of herbicides a lot of times because really with the solar panels, what you want is you want to keep them clean because that's how they stay efficient. So you have to wash them a lot. So it requires using a lot of water. They don't want, you know, things growing up around that could interfere mechanically or block the sun at all, things like this. Um, as far as wind goes. The scariest thing that I have learned from uh, all of these various meetings that I've gone to with local groups here is that according to the Hydraulics Agency of Spain, the solar, the wind parks that are planned because uh, they're getting so, because they're so big and so high, you don't realize that it's not like, it's not like you put a windmill down and it just like covers the surface. You have to drill as far as you see, as high as you see, you have to drill almost as deep into the ground to be able to anchor this thing down. And now they're doing these like mega wind, mega windmills. I mean, they're just gigantic. They're like huge skyscrapers out there in the middle of your mountains, right? Well, these could pierce the aquifers, pierce the aquifers. That means they're going to drain our aquifers. They could drain our aquifers. I mean, it's terrible. And like the government knows this. It's terrifying when you think about it. Yeah, it is the, the, the environmental impacts of renewable energy, they're far too infrequently reckoned with. I, I, I often see complaints about there being a ban here in the UK on onshore wind farms. You know, this is ridiculous. Stop, stop it with the nimbyism, get it built. And I didn't know about the aquifers. But that, that point you made even just about the impact on the um, the natural landscape, which isn't just for us humans to enjoy and go, what a nice view, is ultimately a migratory bird patterns. Uh, you, you're going to be disrupting all sorts of other life out there. I was uh, reading about and watching short snippets from a documentary on the impact of offshore wind farms the other day on whales uh, and dolphins because of their so sonar detection. and um, they within that those snippets of the documentary they were um they were simulating the the, the noise that they would hear um when these things were, were were planted in the sea and effectively it's discombobulating them so much that they're either dying before they even get to shore but there are many whales be washing up on shore near places where offshore wind farms have been built and so there'll be some who say, look, we can't get in the way of progress here. You know, we've got no choice. We've got to reduce carbon emissions and have an, an, a, a renewable energy future. But I do think it's utterly reckless to dismiss um, the, the health of the ecologies, which includes animals and plants too, right? That's all part of creation. And if we're going to be good stewards of it, if we're going to actually try to um, live in accordance with uh, the way things work together, then I think we need to think about those things. We can't just think about, well, this will, this will work to our, towards our energy mix and this will help us meet our targets without paying attention to the actual impacts that we're having out on the world. Yeah, yeah, yes, exactly. But, you know, if if the main thing in Germany is to keep the car industry alive and you need energy to do that, you know, and this is prevailing wisdom. That's it, it. It's part of, it's part of the equation, right? Yeah, it is. What, what do you think the developments uh, that we're likely to see coming on European green deal is, can, do you, um, stay close to what you hear coming out of Brussels or um, as far as I have picked up sustainable finance regulation all of those regulatory mechanisms they've been set now and they're just going to let the market respond to them that's what I read one of the people from Brussels uh, writing about the other day um, but what do you have a sense of what we might see in response to those regulations or practical consequences or more of the same, more of what we've been talking about? 
My overall sense with the Green Deal is that um, it's a lot of what 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 the original plan was is simply going to be mitigated because it's not it's not doable unless you're really willing. It's not doable. You can't the, another for another publication, not the European Conservative that I write for. Someone else had told me the problem with the Green Deal is that. It proposes a win-win-win. We can have it all. We can have our cake and eat it too. We can, uh, and this was actually a Catholic priest who uh, teaches on business and, and Catholic social teaching and stuff. And he's like, anytime anybody promises you a heaven on earth, you usually end up with a hell on earth. And so that we can, we can have it all. We can keep, we can keep our same uh, lifestyles. We can keep our same uh, economic production. And we can have this incredible environmental policy. Well, we're finding that that as the reality is, that's simply not the case. And so the Green Deal is just getting watered down. A lot of the restoration, you know, the, the nature restoration law, um, certain things have been watered down in that the farmers are still are still not necessarily satisfied, even with like um, the green finance. Um, I believe that having, you know, if you, I can't, I'm sorry, I'm com not coming up with details off the top of my head, but I, but if you look at almost every regulation, all of it has been watered down one way or another versus what the commission had proposed. Because, because it's politically is extremely difficult to sell. Except I would have to say, except probably renewable energy targets. That's probably the one area that has increased, actually, now that I think about it, they, that they've um, fast tracked. But like, um, but anything that anything that would impact industry, anything that has like, except for except for the electric cars. OK, I will say except for the electric cars. Um, but a lot of things that end up impacting industry and energy prices has been watered down. Like nuclear was not supposed to be considered a green energy in the new taxonomy, I believe. Um, and then, I'm sorry, I can't, I'm not coming up with, with details. But overall. That's right. It was, it was excluded. And um, then that, uh, as was natural gas, wasn't seen as a, an appropriate transition fuel before you got to renewable energy um and the criticism of r removing both of those things is whilst obviously nuclear has the problem of you've got to deal with nuclear waste for generations to come um is it's zero emissions and the most energy dense thing that you could choose so if you want to get very quickly to zero emissions and that's the way you go and you contain it um and the and the criticism of not including natural gas in as a transition fuel was, well, it's 60% less in terms of emissions and pollutants compared to coal, for example. And having excluded both of those two things from the taxonomy, um, or at least for new business activities and investments, is you've had Germany having closed down its nuclear reactors following Fukushima, and it had started before that, then relying on the dirtiest kind of coal to power itself Obviously, the Russian um, invasion of Ukraine meant they couldn't rely on the gas that they had been. And so um, now they're buying nuclear energy from France. And um, I, I think this is this is the binds that we're finding ourselves in, is you've got these renewable energy targets being set, all of these other fuels being told, uh, no, that's not viable. Uh, and actually, we're doing quite well on the renewable energy target, um, or at least meeting them, because, I mean, you've talked about Spain, how the renewable, uh, or written that Spain has had renewable energy targets that um, have been met, that have been absolutely exceeded, and they're still building more and more renewable energy. Yeah, yeah. Um, but we're also, we also haven't like seriously reduced our our gas use or our, our gas, you know, our natural gas purchases and things like that. So we might not be getting piped in Russian natural gas anymore, but we're getting lots of LNG gas from other places, supposedly other places. Probably a lot of it is Russian gas in the end too. 
<laughs> by hook or by truck as it all, you know, kind of ends up on the global market. Yeah. Well, well we've spoken quite a lot about technocracy today. It's, it's real practical impacts. And I think we could probably surmise that, that there's a, there's a blind spot uh, here that, that exists within regulators, legislators, business leaders. How would you fix that? Is that, is there a way of fixing that blind spot? Gosh, I don't know. I mean, I, from what experts, I'm not an expert. I'm just a journalist who talks to experts and writes down what they say and <laughs> learns from them. But from what they tell me, I mean, what we really need is like a deep, deep, deep rethink of a lot of things and to think on a much deeper level. And politics doesn't necessarily lend itself to that all the time. You know, you have the election cycles are very quick. You have to show results or not show results, put forth politically acceptable policies. So I don't know that we're necessarily going to see huge, huge changes unless it's just, you know, going back to just not doing the Green Deal anymore and just keeping things as we as we have them as we go along. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, we'll, we won't hold our breath. We won't hold our breath on the rethink. Uh, uh, no. <laughs> um, Bridget, I appreciate you've been going for almost an hour, so I'm going to let you go. But um, where can people find you? Where can they follow you and and read about your work? Uh, okay. Uh, I write for the European Conservative. I contribute sometimes to America Magazine as well. Um, I do have a Twitter account, um, but I don't really put anything in it. So, um, yeah, good luck finding me. I hope you do. And... <laughs> I think I might have already tried to at mention you in advance of this conversation to say. Oh, oh and you're legit. like, oh, she doesn't have anything. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Hopefully we'll coincide somewhere on the World Wide Web unless I get my, you know, publicity act together. So. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure we will. I'm sure we will. Well, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for getting into the murky depths of environmental regulation and its impacts today. Uh, and I hope to carry on the conversation. I'm sure you've got much more to write about and i'll be certainly following it thank you likewise all right thanks very much Bridget. okay bye bye thank you for joining me in thinking class today to keep up to date with all that i am doing please subscribe to the thinking class youtube channel at thinking class and follow me on x at thinking classes Thinking Class seeks to understand the civilizational issues we face and why what our leaders do in response matters here, I seek to explore the ideas, values, and culture that made our civilization, those that are unmaking it, and how leaders at our public and private institutions should respond. Engage with me on YouTube or X, or write to me at thinkingclasspod at gmail.com to tell me who you want me to speak to and what topics are important to you. I look forward to seeing you there and for joining me on this journey.